Good morning, people of God. This is the day the Lord has made. The birds are singing, the sun is shining. We are gathered in God's presence, both here in person as well as online. Special word of welcome to those who are with us uh, from afar this morning. Today is the second Sunday in Lent. We are in um, this season of journeying with Jesus to the cross. We'll talk about that in our uh, scripture readings and in the sermon today. At Zion, we are uh, dedicating Lent as a season in which we are called to make space for God. And so that invitation had come to you last week to uh, think about ways to make space for God. Uh, and I want to ask uh, Mary Oliver to come and share a few thoughts on that matter. Uh, as we think about making space for God, um, this coming week we'll be returning to our schedule of uh, small groups as well as council meeting on, on Monday night. So Mary, uh, share a word. Good morning. <laughs> Last week, Dan Barthold talked about making ourselves available to God. Today, I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about what that means to me. First, I need to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, since I've only been around here for like five years, I know some of you don't know a whole lot about me, but most of you know that I grew up in Lidditz and went to Warwick, but luckily you don't hold that against me. <laughs> you know that I play French horn, and hopefully I'll be playing here at Zion again soon. You might also know that I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Sorry, all you Eagles fans, but I grew up a Steelers fan. And I just hope that we can find a quarterback soon. <laughs> a few of you know I'm also a huge Baltimore Orioles fan. And I hope that we can find some pitching soon. It's been about 10 years, I think, since we had really good pitching. It would be nice. Um, but I've been a fan of both of those teams since I was in elementary school. And I can remember watching the Steelers on Channel 8 every week during the fall and winter. And then in the spring, summer, and even into the fall, if the wind was blowing just right and the antenna on the roof would stay in just the right position, we would watch Orioles baseball games on Channel 11 from Baltimore. Back then, the Orioles were good and actually played in the postseason in the fall. Um, at the time, I had no idea that I would end up spending most of my adult life living in and around Baltimore. So I've stayed stuck with the Orioles in spite of the fact that their last winning season was back in 2016. But they're still my team, and baseball's my favorite sport. I'm very happy that it appears the players' union and the owners finally reached an agreement this week, and spring training actually starts today. I've always followed my teams and sports in general. Even now, I spend a lot of time listening to sports talk radio over the internet. I find it entertaining to listen to all of the so-called experts talking about sports and see how often they get it right or wrong. Um, there are so many buzz phrases that they use over and over and I usually ignore, but Sometimes I remember the things that they say and I try to apply it to things other than just sports. You might also know that I'm part of the group that's been meeting to brainstorm ideas for our 250th anniversary. In our latest meeting, Dan talked about being available to God. And at that point, it hit me, there's a sports quote about that somewhere. And I couldn't remember it exactly, but I said it was something along the lines of the best ability is availability. I tried to explain what that meant, <laughs> saying it doesn't mean just making, being available for games, but also just being available for your teammates. But I didn't do a very good job in the meeting. A few days later, I finally Googled the quote to make sure I got it right, and sent an email first to Pastor Kate, and then she said, you should send this to the rest of the group, so I did. And when I got some good feedback from them, um, Pastor Kate asked me if I would share that email with all of you. So this is what I wrote. I wanted to clarify the sports quote that I used in our meeting. It's credited to longtime NFL coach Bill Parcells. The quote is, the greatest ability is availability. 
My interpretation of that is it doesn't matter who's the fastest or the strongest. What matters is you are available to do whatever is needed at the moment. You have to be available to your team, not just on the field. It could be being available to take a phone call from a teammate who's having some issues off the field or giving a teammate a ride to a doctor appointment. It's just making yourself available. To me, it's an in-the-moment concept, not a long-term concept, which in my mind is more dependability. That, to me, can be overwhelming. So just be available when an opportunity happens. It could be the only opportunity you get. If we aren't available to God to do whatever needs to be done in the moment, we may not have another opportunity. It could be delivering a meal from the summer lunch program or giving someone a ride to or from church. If we make ourselves available, opportunities will happen. Thank you, Mary. Some of you know that I have been um, struggling with bronchitis this past week. I am hopeful that I am um, much, much better today. We'll see how it goes. I will, um, out of uh, respect and concern for you, be masking for the distribution of Holy Communion once again this week. Our opening hymn, Guide Me Ever Great Redeemer, leads us uh, into the wilderness with Jesus. Let us rise and worship together. Thank you. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. We take a moment for silent self-examination. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. 
We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of the covenant, in the mystery of the cross, you promise everlasting life to the world. Gather all peoples into your arms and shelter us with your mercy, that we may rejoice in the life we share in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading today is from the 15th chapter of Genesis. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer, I'm sorry, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, this man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, 
A deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 27 responsively. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise up against me, my trust will not be shaken. One thing I ask the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to seek God in the temple. For in the day of trouble, God will give me shelter, hide me in the hidden places of the sanctuary, and raise me high upon a rock. Hear my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me and answer me. My heart speaks your message. Seek my face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not away from your servant in anger. Cast me not away. You have been my helper. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my oppressors. Subject me not to the will of my brothers, for they rise up against me. False witnesses breathe lies. This I believe, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord and be strong. Take heart. Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amidst all the news about the war in Ukraine this week, 
There have been a number of articles and references to the religious context of that region. I don't know if you've seen those. Um, we note, for example, that Ukrainian President Zelensky is Jewish, and his story points to the rich history of a Jewish community in Ukraine, along with a history of anti-Semitism. The majority religion in Ukraine is Orthodox Christianity, and there have been pictures in the news of beautiful churches, tremendous art, and the amazing iconography of the Orthodox tradition. But it is also the case that complexities abound in that region. So there are two different Orthodox church branches in Ukraine, with loyalties and affiliations divided between Ukrainian and Russian leadership. When the Russian invasion of Ukraine began last month, the patriarch, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow, unequivocally spoke in support of the invasion, invasion and Putin's strategy to take over Ukraine. This pro-government stance from the Russian Orthodox Patriarch has alienated members of the church in Ukraine and has been widely condemned globally, with the likely result that there will be schism and disruption in the Orthodox churches and with the Roman Catholic churches of the region and beyond. That's a bit of a simplified background for a picture that resonated with me in the news this week. It is reprinted on the back of your bulletin, if you haven't seen it, and uh, Bailey, if you want to pull that up for the live stream. Uh, I found this picture to resonate with today's gospel. The image is a life-sized statue of the crucified Jesus with his arms outstretched. And the statue is being moved out of a cathedral in Ukraine to be stored in a bunker for protection while the war rages. At every level, this is an image of Jesus at his most vulnerable. I can appreciate the desire to safeguard sacred objects and would do the same as these men. And at the same time, this move is full of irony because Jesus himself did not turn away from danger when he was warned that Herod wanted to kill him. As the gospel tells us today, Jesus will choose to walk directly to the lair of Herod, that wily ruler who has already killed John the Baptist and who exercises power on behalf of the Roman Empire occupying Israel. Jesus must be on his way today, he says, because Jesus identifies and joins with all those who suffer and die, and he loves us unto death. On this second Sunday in Lent, with this photo from the news and with the images in our gospel, we can begin to see the way of the cross. Jesus does not turn away from threats to his life, but he will open his arms on the cross like a mother hen sheltering her little ones. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I desired to gather your children as a hen that gathers her brood under her wings, Jesus says. Lent leads Jesus and his followers to Jerusalem. The fox and the hen will meet in Jerusalem. The Devious and death-dealing powers and principalities of this world will nail Jesus to the cross in Jerusalem. Jesus will die there, arms outstretched, breast exposed, in an act of vulnerable, sacrificial, redeeming love for us. The crucified Christ tells us that love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing, compared to love in dreams. Even today, those who look to the cross or gaze upon the image of a crucified Christ such as this will be rewarded with no beautiful sight to behold but the 
broken, bloody truth of love in action. This is where Lent leads us to the profound mystery of our faith, that the outstretched arms of Jesus on the cross are a promise and a sign that love in the end is stronger than death, and this love saves and redeems us for life. In all honesty, though, the redeeming power of God's love revealed in the cross of Christ is not by any measure an easy or obvious thing to understand. And the truth is this, God knows how difficult it is for us to understand and trust God's promises in a world where foxes always seem to get their way. As we go about our lives, as we seek to care for our families and one another, as we try our best to be faithful in this broken, weary, beautiful world, how do we know God's promises are true for us? How do we know God will be faithful to us? These are the questions raised by scripture today. Thousands of years ago, in a very different context from our own, a man named Abram wrestled with these questions. What does it mean to trust God's faithful promises in an uncertain world? God had promised Abram an heir and land. God had promised Abram descendants more numerous than the stars in the sky. But after following God's lead and moving from his home to an unknown land, after years and years of waiting and years of hoping, Abram still had no son. What do you do when there is no evidence that God's promises are trustworthy or true? What do you do when everything you've hoped for seems futile or hopeless? What do you do when the center doesn't hold, when the world seems to be crashing down all around you, or when death is at hand? Do not be afraid, God says to Abram in Genesis 15. But still, Abram is troubled by the details of God's promises. Nothing seems to be working as expected. Here is this great man chosen by God, and he is filled with doubts and questions as he tries to cling to the promises in faith. Is Abram's God a faithful God? worthy of trust and devotion. In Genesis 15, God makes a bold commitment to Abram. In our Old Testament reading, God says, yes, Abram, I am faithful. God says, yes, you can trust the promise. And then God gives a sign of faithfulness. God goes beyond words, and God makes a covenant, an unbreakable, binding agreement with Abram. The covenant ceremony described in Genesis 15 is odd and cryptic. But the strange story describes something called the cutting of the covenant, and it sets the foundation for God's relationship with Abram and with us in a profoundly significant way. Here, God is saying, may I be as dead and destroyed as those cut up animals if I fail to keep my promises to you, Abram. Now, normally all parties in a covenant agreement assume equal obligations and risks. But here, God alone bears the obligations and risks of the covenant. Here, God is offering unconditional love and faithfulness. Just before the mysterious cutting of the covenant ceremony, God tells Abram to look to the stars in the sky, to see those stars as sign and promise. The heart of the matter is here. Go out and look to the sky, God tells Abram. Look at those amazing stars, God says. Your future is like this. Your future is filled with descendants, amazing and bright. 
When you doubt, Abram, look to the sky. When you are filled with questions, look to the sky and remember the future. Look to the stars and remember a future filled with God's promises. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus take us to the same point of God's covenant faithfulness and his promise for a holy future. Like a mother hen safeguarding her chicks, Jesus will offer his body, his blood, his very life in a sign of God's new covenant for us a covenant for the forgiveness of sins, and a promise of salvation for the sake of eternal life. Remember that your future is forgiveness and life, the cross says. Look to the cross and remember the future. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jesus laments, the city that kills prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Jesus said he must go there to preach and teach and to heal and to gather and to establish God's covenant of redeeming love and grace with us. It is as natural and instinctive for Jesus to go to Jerusalem as it is for a mother hen to open her wings and gather her chicks. Unsettled times in an unsettled city do not deter Jesus. Threats to his own life do not distract Jesus from fulfilling his mission. The very real presence of evil and danger do not stop him and in fact deepen his stance of love. Nothing would deter him from taking his stand, arms outstretched like the wings of a mothering hand, arms outstretched to gather and save God's children. In his lament for Jerusalem, Jesus says, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Jesus knows, and he bluntly reminds us that on our own, you and I are weak and stubborn and in need of help. We are born children of a fallen humanity. In our unsettled and unsettling world, foxes prowl, and the power of sin and death is very real. Leaning on our own wisdom and power, you and I will fall short. On our own, we will follow our own ways and get lost. Some of us will be drawn to admire and follow the fox that one with clever words and wily promises. Some will run and hide in fear and shame. We will all stumble and fall. We all need places of rest and safety. We all need to remember our future at home in the shelter of God's love and care. We need one whose promises we can trust. So how do we know who we can trust? In the end, in Jerusalem, the hen risked it all and outfoxed the fox with the surprising power of love. With arms stretched out in love on the cross, Jesus shows us the very face and heart of God with us, God for us. In Jesus, God conquers sin and life overcomes death. By grace, through faith, by way of the cross, God promises that because Christ lives, we too shall live. How do we know we can trust the promise of God's love to save and redeem us? On the cross, with arms outstretched and life ebbing away, Jesus shows us what forgiveness looks like. With arms outstretched like the wings of a mothering hen, Jesus shows us what the power of love looks like. With his arms spread out on the cross and bearing the weight of human sin and pain and fear, Jesus shows us what God's strong arms look like. 
Christ's arms stretched out on the cross are a sign of God's faithfulness and covenant love for us. How often have I desired to gather you as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, God says. How often have I desired to shelter you and hold you in love. In covenant faithfulness to us, this is Jesus' invitation even today that we turn and be welcomed with saving grace into a place of belonging under Jesus' wings, and that knowing the safety and protection of such a place, we can live into God's promised future, filled and overflowing with a love that gives and sustains life now and forever. Amen. rise as you are able for a confession of faith. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer our prayers for one another, the church, and the world. Responding, merciful God, receive our prayer. God of grace and God of glory, you gather the church into a community of mercy and grace. Unify Christians around the globe in our call to proclaim the good news of your saving love. 
embolden prophets who proclaim your ways, even in the face of opposition. Protect all whose lives are imperiled by the gospel. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You sent Jesus to live among us and show us your ways of righteousness and life. Make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You calm and quiet us, eternal God, as a mother holds her children close. All people have refuge in the shadow of your wings. Spread over us the shelter of your peace. Hold before us the wisdom of your cross, where we are drawn to you not by might or power, but by your boundless love and forgiveness revealed in Jesus Christ. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of peace and justice, we pray for all people living in the midst of conflict and war, especially in Ukraine, also in Yemen and Ethiopia. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, who cannot see a future. We pray that your spirit of comfort would draw near and enfold them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. We pray for those seeking refuge, that they would find gracious shelter. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear, that you would uphold and protect them. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You hear us when we cry to you. Uphold all who are standing in the need of prayer and healing mercy this day, especially those on our prayer list those whose needs are known only to you, those we name aloud and in our hearts before you now. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You welcome us into your heavenly realm. We give thanks for those whose labors on earth are ended and who now rest with you. On the final day, gather all of us with them in your loving arms. Merciful God, our accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Share a sign and a word of peace with one another. Peace be. You may be seated.
Let us pray together. Generous God, we bring these gifts to you in gratitude for your loving provision. We offer you our very lives in thanksgiving for your many blessings. Take our lives and use our gifts that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. This we pray in the name of the one who came in holy love. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God provides bread for the journey. May we come to the table, find shelter and protection, and taste the goodness of the Lord. We will commune by continuous progression down the center aisle, uh, beginning with the choir and then following by sides. Just a reminder that um, we'll need time to change uh, direction one, once we change sides. Um, there are baskets for the empty communion cups at the end of the rows. All is ready. Let us worship.
Please rise for the blessing and prayer. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed Jesus, in this rich meal of grace, you have fed us with your body, the bread of life. Now send us forth to bear your life-giving hope to a world in need. Amen. And may the peace of God enfold us, the love of God uphold us, the wisdom of God guide us as we go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.